Okay. All righty. Okay, so good morning. I'd like to uh, welcome you to Hope Community Fellowship, and I'd like to thank you for choosing to come and worship with us this morning. If this is your first time with us, we're, we're glad that you came. And if this is not your first time with us, well, welcome back. So uh, I continue to recap what we've learned so far in the letter to the saints in Ephesus each week because, like I've told you, verse thir verses 3 through 14 in Ephesians 1, uh, in the original Greek, it's one continuous sentence, and therefore it's one continuous thought. And so I just want to keep making sure that we're staying up with what we've learned in the previous weeks, since it is one continuous thought. And so I thought, you know, this, this single thought that we are looking at that's going to take several weeks for us to get through is about the spiritual blessings that those who are in Christ receive. So this passage is one of the few places in the Bible, by the way, where we're going to see the Trinity. I mean, we're looking at God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we see in this passage how they work in unison fulfilling their individual role in accomplishing the will and the purpose of God. So I made this outline uh, to give you a visual representation of what the spiritual blessings are and how they fit into the passage. Before we even begin to study uh, this portion of the letter, we had discussed uh, what it means to be in Christ. And, and we came to the understanding that, that those who are in Christ are just simply people who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And the spiritual blessings that Paul teaches about in these verses are for those who are in Christ. Now, last week we began to examine uh, the, the passage by looking at what it means to be chosen by God. We learned that, that all of those who respond by faith to the invitation of Jesus Christ to be their Savior are chosen by God to belong to a group of those who are in Christ. They're chosen to belong to that group. Now, as you can see on the outline that this week, our study in verses 5 and 6 it's going to teach us of the spiritual blessing of being predestined for adoption. So, so please turn in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. But as always, before we read our verse and before we get started on our study, let's ask the Lord to bless our time in His Word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, we do just want to thank You so much for Your Word. Father God, we... We just thank you for the truth that we find in your word, Lord, and for the love that we see that you give to us through the truth of your word. Father God, prepare our hearts to receive your word. Open our eyes, Lord. Open our ears. And let it not just glance off of us, but let us take it in and, and, and to consume your word, Lord. That's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So Ephesians 1, verse 5 and 6 says, In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. So the subject of this passage is the predestination of those in Christ for adoption. And the subject of predestination and the adoption of those who are in Christ, that they're predestined to, are the primary focus of this passage today. However, there's two words that are lingering right there from verse 4. And sometimes, you know, sometimes... 
it's hard to understand when they came to make the to, when, when they came up to to make the Bible and you know they they put in where the verses end and and where they stop and where they're going to put in periods and all that. Sometimes it's hard to understand how did they come up with this. This is one of those prime examples because obviously those first two words in love they don't belong with verse four. They belong with verses five and six. So. So before we get to our thought and, and talk about predestination for adoption, I want to deal with those first two words real quick. So briefly, the motivation for God predestining people for adoption is his love. The idea that, that those in Christ are predestined for adoption, it begins with why would God do such a thing? And it's because of his love. The Bible tells us that God is love. We read in the Bible, anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. Now we've heard that question before. What's love? Well, here's your answer. God. God is love. There's no single expression that can encapsulate what love really is because it's the totality of the one and the only true and living God in all of his holiness, in his righteousness, in his mercy, in his grace, and in every other characteristic that we see about God all at one single time in God, that's what love is. And it's for this reason that it is humanly impossible to understand what love is. Because we don't have the capacity to understand God. And the Bible tells us that God is love. Now, while it's difficult for us to fully understand love, we do somewhat know what love is. And we have some passages in the Bible that try and help us understand what love is. One of them is the most famous passage in all of the world, in my opinion, which is going to be, that's right, John 3, 16, which says, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then we also read in Romans 5, 8, it says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Passages like these help us to understand God's love for his special creation, mankind, those created in his own image. Everything that God does for mankind is out of the abundance of his love. And our verse today, we're going to see that it's because of God's love that he predestines those in Christ for adoption into his family. So now that we understand God's motive, and we've dealt with those first two words that actually were part of verse four, but they clearly belong with this. Now that we understand his motive, let's begin to dissect what it means to be predestined. Predestination is another one of those divisive Christian issues. Predestination is the idea that before you were ever born, God decided your path. And according to the Bible, predestination is an absolute fact and it is truth. But it doesn't mean that it can't be misunderstood or taken out of context. So when God first spoke to the prophet Jeremiah, God said to the prophet Jeremiah, he said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you as a prophet 
to the nations. See, this verse is the greatest biblical endorsement of predestination that there is. I mean, God told Jeremiah that he consecrated him and he appointed him before he was ever conceived in his mother's womb. He told this to Jeremiah, by the way, to encourage him because Jeremiah thought that he was too young to carry God's message to the kings. And that's why God told him this. So predestination, again, it's, it's like, it's like the, when we studied being chosen last week, which, by the way, the, when we studied being chosen, that's also called election. This is a divisive issue among Christians. Even though there's clear biblical evidence that I just give you that people are predestined, uh, it's, it, it's something that, that, that can be divisive for us. I mean, clearly, God does predestine individuals. And by the way, it's my belief that God predestines every single creation, that he, every person that he creates is predestined. But the divide comes when people try to tie election or being chosen, when they try to tie election to predestination. You see, that's the problem. Election and predestination are not Siamese twins. They are not joined and mutually dependent upon each other. They can stand on their own. Election can stand on its own. It does not need predestination. Predestination can stand on its own. It does not need election to stand on their own. But the divide in Christianity is because People try to keep them linked together. You can only be chosen. You can only have election with predestination. And it's not how it is. Let them go. Let them be their own, their own things, okay? Because just because God predestined every individual that he ever created, it does not mean that each and every individual that God ever created is chosen. Remember, to be a part of the chosen, to be a part of those in Christ, the individual must respond to God's giving them the option to be saved by Christ or not. Now, it's certainly true that every person in the group of those who are in Christ is also predestined. Not only did God choose them and put them in the group of those who are in Christ, but he also determined their, their future. He, he determined what he was creating them for. But it's also a true statement that all who are in Christ are predestined, but it's also a true statement that all those who are not in Christ can be predestined as well. Just because somebody doesn't choose faith and therefore they're not part of the group that's called in Christ it doesn't mean that God did not create and predestine them. Just because they're not part of the family of faith does not mean that God did not predestine them for what they're going to do in life. The Apostle Paul wrote about this in the letter to the Romans. He says, For Scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Now, Pharaoh did not believe in the one and only true and living God. He did not believe in the God of Israel. But he certainly and absolutely was predestined by God to fulfill the role that he fulfilled 
in history. And the Bible clearly tells us this. Every person ever created has a destiny to fulfill that was predetermined by God. Whether they choose to be numbered among the family of faith or not is their own choice. Because God still has a plan for their life. But their own choice of whether they're going to be numbered among the family of faith or not is called free will. They have a will that they can make the decision whether they're going to accept Christ as their Savior or not. And whether they choose to belong to the family of faith or don't choose to belong to the family of faith, it does not mean that they cannot fulfill the role that God has chosen for their life. Now, as you go home today thinking about what I just told you, that you have a destiny to fulfill. God has predestined each and every one of you. He has a role for you to play in this world. Now, as you go home and you think about that, just remember, your destiny is always to fulfill God's purpose for His plan and for His glory. That's what He created you for. God did not create you for your own pleasure, for your own greatness, for your own glory. That is not what God created you for. He did not create you to spend all your time building up your self and focusing on this kingdom, your kingdom in this world. And every second that you spend building up yourself and your kingdom in this world is a second spent in vain. Not only that, you're being disobedient to God. So what's this verse saying that we're predestined for then? If we're predestined, what are we predestined for? Now remember, this letter is for those who are in Christ. So what are those people who are in Christ, the family of faith, what are they predestined for? It says he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. So, so without much thought, if you're just reading the Bible, by the way, and you start in Ephesians, and you start going on down, and you just start reading this, without much thought to what is said right here, it's simple just to pass it over. And by the way, the scripture, all it simply means is, is that God, before the beginning of the earth, he chose destiny for you, okay? And that's all that this means. And if you're just reading across the Bible, that's all you're going to get out of it. Boom, quick. Didn't even mean anything to you. But these 12 words have so much depth to them. So let's continue plumbing that depth and just make and have a discussion about adoption. Because let me ask you this. Why would Paul, who is a Jew, why would Paul use a metaphor to describe a believer's relationship to God that the Jews don't really even know anything about? Adoption? I mean, in Jewish society, adoption was very rare. Never happened, really. In ancient Judaism, polygamy was acceptable. I mean, if a woman was unable to bear a child, it was not uncommon, it was not uncommon at all for them to Get a slave woman to bear a child for the man. And that way, his name would carry on. Totally acceptable in that culture. I mean, come on, think about the biblical story. Abraham, Sarah, you know, they, they, they got the slave woman. So just think about that story. And then in the law of Moses, in Deuteronomy, there's also a provision that is called Leverite marriage. And Leverite marriage is that if, if a man dies without having a son, his brother is obligated to marry his widow 
and produce a son that will carry on his name. The first male that's produced from that union will carry on the dead brother's name. So now why would Paul be teaching about adoption in this letter to the Ephesians, to the believers at Ephesus? Well, Ephesus was a Roman city, remember? It was part of the, the it was part of Rome. And it was a city full of Gentiles. Adoption was very common among them. So this imagery would be familiar to them about the legal rights of an heir. And adoption is very common in our modern society as well. And uh, I was looking it up. In Illinois, here's what the law says about adoption rights or about uh, uh, inheritance rights of adopted children. Listen to what Illinois law says. It says, an adopted child is a descendant of the adopting parents for the purpose of inheritance from the adopting parents and from the lineal and collateral kindred of the adopting parents and for the purpose of determining property rights of any person under any instrument. And I would imagine that most states have pretty much this exact same law. And what it's all that it's saying basically is, look, when you adopt a kid, they are 100% equal with your own biological children. And guys, we all know people who could not have kids. They could not have kids. They could not have kids. They adopt a child and boom, she's pregnant immediately after the adoption. We all know them. So this absolutely happens all the time. In our society, you know, adopted children are completely equal with biological children. And it was the same way throughout the Roman Empire at that time as well. Adopted heirs were totally equal with the blood heirs in that kingdom. And there's the greatest example, by the way, of this happening in the Roman Empire is a guy named Gaius Octavian Thurinus. That's a hard one to say, by the way. I had to practice that several times this week. Gaius Octavian Thurnus was adopted by Julius Caesar, which made him Julius Caesar's legal heir. He later became known as Augustus Caesar, the first emperor of Rome. So the first emperor of Rome he was not in the biological bloodline of his father who gave him the kingdom. He was an adopted son. So this message that Paul is conveying to believers and to all of us, to those believers and all of us, is that through the metaphor of adoption uh, is that God loves them so much. All those who are in Christ are equal heirs in the kingdom. And then the next thing he tells them, not only are they equal heirs, but they're as sons. Now, this is not a gender issue, by the way. So why does Paul say as sons if it's not a gender issue? Because, by the way, uh, women who are believers in Christ, totally co-equal heirs also. So why does Paul say as sons if it's not a gender issue? Well, in much of the ancient world, at that time, uh, inheritance was passed through sons. It were, it were males who the inheritance was passed through. As a matter of fact, in Jewish culture, so when Paul's speaking to the Jews that are in Ephesus also, in Jewish cultures, they would have understood that, hey, the oldest son even gets a double portion of the inheritance. But the whole point to it is, as sons, is that inheritance is passed through the males as the sons. So what he's telling all believers is, look, you're being adopted by God as sons. So regardless of your gender, regardless of your age, you are on equal footing with all other people. Everybody is being adopted as the same through here. You're going to receive the exact same inheritance regardless. And then the final words in the passage, he says, through Jesus Christ. Only those who are in Christ are eligible for adoption. Those who choose not to respond 
to God's free offer of salvation through Jesus Christ will not inherit the kingdom. And that's the application for those who are hearing this message that have never placed their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have not received the benefit of adoption. You are not an heir. You will not inherit the kingdom. And by the way, placing your faith in Christ, all that it simply means is that you are acknowledging that sin has separated you from God. But by repenting of your sin, and remember, repenting, it, it means that, that you're moving away from God. You know, sin has separated you from God. You've, you've moved away from God. All that repenting means is, look, I'm, I'm turning from my life that's moving away from God. I'm turning back towards God. I'm just turning back towards God. If you do that and, and you simply believe that Jesus' death on the cross, His resurrection three days later, His burial, His resurrection, that to eternal life, that that can save you, that's all placing your faith in Him truly is. Now for those of you who claim Christ as your Savior, those who were in Christ, the application to this for you is to understand and realize what it means to be adopted by God. So Lisa recently shared with me a story from her daily devotion, and it's about a couple who was going to adopt a child. And the story of the couple, they went into an orphanage to, to pick a child out, and, and they were shocked when it was completely silent as they walked through there and seen all of these children. And it was completely silent. And the man said, the babies in the crib never cried. And it wasn't because they never needed anything, but because they learned that no one cared enough to answer. Now, except for children who are adopted at birth, so they're taken right away from the hospital, children are usually adopted out of bad situations. I mean, frequently they come from situations where there has been very little love, if any, at all. Many of them come from deplorable situations where they have suffered greatly without anyone who actually cares. I read story after story this week looking for stories for this. And I read story after story about people or about kids being adopted out of some really horrendous circumstances. And those kids were adopted and they were put into a loving family where they were provided with the things that they needed, with warm, clean clothing, with, with food, with a bed, with a pillow. I mean, just some of the basics of life, but the main thing that they received was they received love. And that's what these orphans needed most of all, and they needed a lot of it. And for those who are in Christ, that is our story. Before we chose to follow Jesus Christ, we live in the trash heap of this world as an orphan with very little real love. Now, as I wrote these words this week, I thought about that, and I was like, listen, I grew up in a loving home. I grew up in a loving home. But you know what, though? We all, before we accepted Christ and are loved by God in Christ, we truly grew up with very little love. And I know that it may be hard for you to swallow that and accept that, but listen to what I'm saying. Often the love that we have as human beings, is conditional love. It's not that we want to, by the way, and you condition your love also. The love that you give is typically conditional because you're human. I do it, you do it, we all do it. Love in this world is conditional. As long as you will X, whatever, 
whatever standard it is that you have to perform to to receive somebody's love. We, we only receive conditional love in this world and we only give conditional love in this world. But when you're accepted, when you accept God's gracious gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, we are adopted into his family. Listen to what the Bible says. It says, for all who were led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Amen? Amen. Those who are in Christ are co-heirs with Christ. God has adopted you into His family and He has showered His love upon you. It's because of God's great love that we're accepted into his family as sons with full inheritance rights. You will inherit the kingdom of God because of his love. And once God's love lavished his love upon you and brought you into his family, there's nothing that's going to take that love away. Nothing at all can take that love away. Listen to what Paul says when he writes to the, to the Romans in that letter, he says, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in, in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is nothing that can take away God's love from you. If you're a child of the king, then act like it. Start living like you are a child of the king. Uh, Live a life fully devoted to God the Father, to Jesus Christ, to the Holy Spirit. Live fully devoted to them, to the Father who was willing to spare nothing not even his own son, so that he could capture your heart in love. Live a victorious life in Christ Jesus. God loves you so much. He doesn't want you to continue living in the orphanage. God wants you to realize that you're adopted into his family. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you so much for your word, Lord. We thank you that we are adopted into your family, Lord. We thank you so much for the love that you have shed upon us. Father God, we just pray that that we can take that love, Lord, and and that, that number one, we can understand it. We can understand how much you love us. Father God, we just pray that that we can take that love out into this world and shine a light into dark places, Lord, and share your love with other people. Father God, help us to be the salt of this world. Help us to be the light of this world as we leave these doors, Lord. Help us to introduce people to your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in His precious name we pray. Amen.